yes, kids, kids, go back to words you don't want to listen to me anyways. I know you don't even like it the once a month, sorry, you won't get to me longer. Um, Josh, it wasn't your fault, I ran through out there and you were That's all right. Go ahead, have fun, kids. So, recently, um, some of you guys may know, I own a software company. And the way that we sell that software is through a sales team of about 17 people. And we've been trying to expand recently, so in the last two or three months, we have hired and we did through about 25 candidates. And I say candidates because when I first started about three years ago, when we hired our first salesman, I can remember going through the process of you know, a phone interview and then two or three in-person interviews and I really wanted to see, you know, can I get to know this person and make sure that they're going to be a good fit for the team because I don't want to invest in training and get them on board if they're not going to take care of my customers. And that lasted for about the first two or three people and then I realized sometimes the best sales job someone does is the interview and they're terrible after that. And so all I can do in the interview is totally weed out someone that does not fill the team and I tell them all, I say, hey listen, you seem like you'd be a good fit. What we're going to do is we're going to throw you a few passes, see if you catch them. If you do, you're on the team and you can be a part of our company. If not, you know, know our feelings, but we'll say see you later. Because everybody can say a whole bunch of stuff that they can do. It is way different to see somebody actually back up all the things that they say that they can do. Right? And we've seen tons of times when people stop off how good they are at something and then we get to the point where they have to prove it and there's nothing, there's no substance. Nothing there. It's a bunch of hot air, uh, and that's what we're going to look at today. Um, there was a um, in Isaiah uh, last week. Joe talked with you guys about how uh, God chose the people of Israel and what it's like to be chosen, and how we, if we have trusted in God, that we've been chosen by God, and all the implications of that. And today we're going to look at um, somebody who is the true God, Jehovah, uh, the one and true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob versus all the other false gods, and, and what that means for us as well as believers today. So, uh, in Isaiah 41, 21, hey, here we go. So, Isaiah 41, 21, uh, this kind of, if you were thinking about it, I love like Law and Order and different, you know, Blue Bloods, different court case scenes, and this is kind of like, um, a court case, if you will. God is, God is saying, all right, fine. Let's look at the evidence. There's all these gods that are claiming to be gods out there. That, uh, you have all the different nations surrounding Israel, and you've got the sun god. You've got just a, a whole host of gods that are claiming to be on the same level as Jehovah God. And Jehovah God finally says, that's it. We're going to see where's the proof, where's the substance. I'm going to actually get past the interview, get you on the phone, and see what you can produce in, in my business. I'll say on the phone, so here's what he says. Verse 21 says, Present your case, the Lord says. Bring forward your strong arguments, the king of Jacob says. Let them bring forth and declare to us what's going to take place. As for the former events, declare what they were, that we may consider them and know their outcome. Or announce to us what's coming. Declare the things that are going to come afterwards that we may know that you are gods. Indeed, do good or evil, that we may anxiously look about us and, and fear together. Behold, you are of no account, and your work amounts to nothing, and he who chooses you is an abomination. Basically, what God is saying here is he says, all right, fine, show me what you got. You know what? Let's make it pretty easy. Why don't you just tell me about creation? How did we get here? Right? What, what, where, how did it start? How did the earth get here? How did the heavens get here? How did the first form of life get here? Tell me about that. Oh, oh, you can't? Yeah, that's, that's kind of tough. How about you tell me about some things in the future? Tell me about the timeline of events. What's going to happen as we move forward into the future? Oh, you can't do that either. How about just tell me one thing? Give me one thing that's going to come up in the future. These gods couldn't do that because the gods that these people were worshiping were no gods at all. They were idols. They were things that they had made. All right? They were um, calves, like you know, the golden calf. There was maybe uh, 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 the, I can't think of the pole that the uh, Indian tribes worship, but there, and it was wood. It was material. It was something man-made. It was not a real God. The, the things that they were praying for rain or they were doing all these different rituals, it was fake. And when God was testing them, saying, listen, can you 
hold up. This is what I can do. I can tell you about the past. I can tell you about creation. I was there. I can tell you what's going to come. I can tell you about all the future their gods couldn't hold up. And I think it's it's easy for us to you know look at them and go, oh, bunch of you know these guys. We don't have idols anymore. How is this applicable for us? And we're going to get there because we do still have idols today. But what I want to point out here is that God has no problem putting himself up against the claims of somebody else because he is the real deal. Okay? There is nothing fake. He can prove who he says he is. We don't have to suspend our intellect to say, well, it doesn't make a bunch of sense, but God claims to be, so I guess I should just blindly believe it. No, no, no. God does not mind being put to the test because when you when you see it for what it is, it is the real deal. And I couldn't help but think as I was kind of putting this together, um, my dad, when we were little, he used to call his Breakfast of Champions. I was actually talking with Darren about it this morning. Uh, he loved grape juice and nilla wafers for if he had to run out of the house really quickly, and that was his breakfast. And my mom always tried to, you know, coupon him and get, you know, not the, the real Nabisco nilla wafers, the ones that came in the Publix box that were still yellow, the box looked the same, they were the same shape and everything, and my dad would grab his little tin and he'd take the first bite and he'd go, this isn't a Nilla wafer. He'd say, what do you mean? He'd say, this isn't, this isn't the real Nilla wafers. How do you know that? I know. Because when you take that first bite, you know when it's real versus when it's a knockoff and it's a little bit fake. God is not the knockoff. He's the real deal. He can tell you about the past. He can tell you about the future. And so he has no problem being put to comparison with the other gods here. Let's keep going uh, to, to what he says next. So he's saying, listen, tell me about the past. Tell me about events in the future. Oh, you can't? All right, well, let me make a prediction about an event that's coming in the future. He says, I have aroused one from the north, and he has come for the rising of the sun. He will call on my name. And he will come upon rulers as upon mortar. He's going to tread you like mortar. He's going to knock you down. Even as the potter treads the clay. Who has declared this from the beginning? That we might know. Has anybody told you guys about this? No? Okay. Or from former times, that we might say, yes, this is right. Surely there is no one who declared. Surely there is no one who proclaimed. Surely there is no one we heard your words. Formerly I said to Zion, Behold, here they are. And to Jerusalem I give a messenger of good news. But when I look, there's no one. And there is no counselor among them. Who, if I ask, can give me an answer? Behold, all of them are false. Their works are worthless. Their molten images are wind and empty. And I looked up that word wind there, and sometimes mean like a bunch of hot air. Okay, when someone's full of hot air, they're just spouting off a bunch of nothing. And so, God here makes a prediction. He says, there's a king that's going to come and conquer you. I don't know it's King Cyrus. Okay? He's going to come and conquer you from the north. And who's told me that? Who's told you that? No one. Because I am the real deal. I am the God that knows what's going to happen because I've planned it all out. I can tell you what's going to happen, and you can watch, and it will happen. I am the true God. The idols have no clue. They can't do that. They can't protect. They can't predict. They're not. They're made up. So Jehovah is demonstrating his superiority here, showing that he is the real God. But there are lots of other people who are trusting in these false gods. And I said a second ago that it's easy for us, 21st century Americans, to think, oh, what a bunch of, you know, these guys, they, they just, how can they be believing in, in this wooden cap and this pole or whatever the heck they're, how can they be believing in these false gods? It's so obvious that they mean nothing. They can't do anything. We don't have idols today like those people had back then. But I don't think that that's actually true. I think we do have idols today. I think our idols just look a little bit different than the idols that someone might have worshipped back then. And, and the real reason that our idols come from is because we want two things. 
If you think honestly about yourself and you look at all the different decisions that you make and what you're trying to pursue in your life, if it comes down to the root thing that you were going after, it's security and freedom. Everything that you're trying to accomplish, you want to get security or freedom. Sorry, one more second. So what do those things mean? Security means we have no fear or anxiety about things to come. Now why is that important? Uh, a lot of times, you know, as change comes in, people say, I don't like change. You know, change is scary. Why is change scary? It's because it's unknown. And what we always naturally do is when we have the unknown come up, we think about all the worst case scenarios. Right? So, for example, uh, my sister recently just got fired. She worked at my dad's company, and it was a weird family dynamic. I've been talking to my sister, and she's been complaining about how she hates her job. And I said, well, then quit and go get a different job. And then I can't do that for whatever reason. And I talked to my dad, and I'm so mad at your sister because she's not doing a good job. Well, then fire her. I can't do that because then we'll have problems in the family. So finally, she did something really bad where she ended up getting fired. And I remember as soon as I heard that, I called her and I said, hey, Ashley, I've heard that you got fired. That's fantastic. And she... I can hear it over the phone. She goes, uh, I guess, sure. How, how is that good? I said, you didn't like that job anyways. Now you're forced to go find something that you can be good at. Yeah, I guess I hadn't really thought of it that way, but sure, this is a good thing. But we don't think about the good things. We always think about the things that might go wrong or the worst case scenarios. But there's all kinds of things that can happen in the unknown and with change. But we want security. And when we don't know what's going to happen, I don't have security. When I've got my job, I know that every day I go do this, my boss is happy. If I do these couple of things, he'll get mad, so I don't do that. And I'm going to get this paycheck, which means I can pay these bills, and I can get this food. There's security in that. And we also want freedom, okay? We want the freedom to not have someone being our boss and telling us what we need to do. Right? Now, sometimes we say that that's control, but if you go the next step down, the reason I want control is so I have freedom of my time and what I do with my, my stuff, right? When we when our freedom gets stopped on us as Americans, we're all about our freedom. Don't tread on my freedom, right? But we're looking in all the wrong places. And so when we should be waiting on God and trusting in God, He doesn't work the way that we expect Him to, we put idols and things in place instead of relying on God and waiting on His timing and trusting in His plans. Because oftentimes His plans do not look like our plans. If I was to go back five years ago and look at my life today and see all the things that I would have to go through, I would probably argue with God about, are we sure we got to do that? I don't really want to go through that. Are you sure it's going to be worth it? But looking back, I can absolutely tell you, man, God knew what he was doing, getting me to this point from where I was. Um, my cousin recently, um, a couple weeks ago, was, uh, I'm sorry, a week ago, time goes by so fast. A week ago, I was in a car accident. Um, Saturday morning, I woke up to a text message from one of my other cousins asking me for prayer. Uh, he's, uh, he's got a wife and five kids, and they were coming back from his parents' house, and a drunk driver hit the median, and the wheel came off and went through the windshield and smashed his face. Um, and the picture was, his face was completely flattened. Um, he, his eyes were swollen shut. His, his, his nose was so pushed into his face that his sinuses couldn't bleed the blood that had come out of his eyes. Um, it was a mess, and the doctors, when they first saw him, they said, there's no medical reason why he's alive. And they were able to go, he had a full facial reconstructive surgery, and it's been a mess, but every step of the way, the doctors have seen the faith in my cousin, and it's been miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, and the first, when my, when my cousin, he was in a coma when they first got him up in the hospital, but the first thing that he could write is, this is going to be an amazing story of God's goodness and and that was the first thing that he thought about. Now, if we could back up a month, and God revealed to John, my cousin, said, hey, um, I'm going to do something really amazing. He said, awesome. That's fantastic. I right, just wanted you to know that. If you left it at that, my cousin would be excited for what was about to come. If he said, I'm going to do something really amazing, a tire is going to smash your face. <laughs> uh, hmm. That doesn't really sound too amazing. Right? Because God doesn't do things the way that we do things. God has a way bigger view of how life works. I, I try to explain it to the teams when we talk about, you know, um, well, why does God let bad things happen? Why are these, you know, because the, the, what he just predicted here is that the king of uh, the north is going to come and tread you like order. Now, wait a second. This is a series on the God.
God of comfort. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound too comforting to me. Well, what I tell my team is I say, imagine the series Harry Potter. There's what, seven, eight books on Harry Potter. But imagine the series Harry Potter. J.K. Rollins writes all these books, and you get the chance to read three words. And then your job is now to go tell J.K. Rollins what she needs to change because she got a couple of things wrong. It sounds ridiculous to read three words out of a seven book novel, and you're now critiquing the author of that? That's weird. That's right, that's weird, right? Even that elephant, that's weird. But we do that all the time. We have, I am one life, one person, and I am trying to tell God how things should be different when it doesn't work the way that I want it to work. And so instead of being patient and trusting in Him, we turn to our eyes. The same way the other the other people in the free centers turn to their idols. And what are our idols? As I said, we want security and we want freedom. It's our bank accounts, right? Our health. Man, my health has been a crazy journey recently, and I know that I have put a lot more. The, the healthier I have become, the less time I've spent on my knees asking God to protect me. That's, i got to work through that. Right? Because when, I'm, when everything's good, I don't need God. But when things are not going so good, I don't necessarily turn to God. I turn to myself. And I try to solve the problems. And I try to step in because I want my own security and my own freedom. But the good thing is, is that the next thing that God says is a very comforting prediction. Let's look at what he says next. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. And a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Now this, we know looking back, is a prediction to Jesus. Okay, this is a prediction to Messiah. But they would not have, you know, reading this in the first century, they would not have seen that. They wouldn't have gone, oh, yeah, hey, Jesus Christ is not going to be born. That's going to happen. But we can look back at history and see, see the prophecy fulfilled in who Jesus was. And so, if we take a second here, let's look at the aspects that, that God says right here. You want to know God? Look at Jesus. Jesus is God. He's God displayed for humankind. We, we get to know God because of who Jesus is. And so let's just look at the things that are mentioned right here. The first thing, says he will bring forth justice to the nations. Um, in studying this, I came across a really cool commentary that I just wanted to share with you. It says, uh, the job of this new servant is to do what Israel failed to do. That job was to bring God's law to the nations that were not Jews. The word for fair decisions or justice in the Hebrew Bible is a mishap. And that word seems to show that the servant had three things that he was supposed to do. Number one, to teach the people that there is only one God and that false gods do not exist. That's what we were just talking about a couple of seconds ago in chapter 41. The second thing is to teach the people God's law that he had already taught the Jews. God gave his law to the Jews uh, and it was to set them apart. Right? And then third, to make right the wrong things in the world uh, so it becomes a more fairer place. All right? That's the justice part. That's what Jesus is going to bring. Jesus is going to bring justice. And this is one of the reasons why the Jews missed him the first time around is because he did bring justice on the cross in reconciling us to God, but he didn't bring the justice under the rule of the Romans that they were looking for. So they wanted this warrior king who was going to come, and they missed. This is one of the reasons why they missed Jesus as the real Messiah. They expect justice in the form of how they were being mistreated physically, not justice in the form of how they needed to be reconciled with God because of their sin. All right, but Jesus is going to come and he's going to bring justice. The next thing that we see here is that he will not cry out and raise his voice. Um, I think we've all been around people that are short-tempered and they just lose it. They fly off the handle really quick. Does anybody like those people? No. Uh, you, know, you think about like the, the coach. Right? I've played football, I've played lacrosse, and I've had different coaches. I've had some that are they want to teach you and help, help you learn. 
and they have someone, the second you make a mistake, what the heck are you doing, Johnson? And they're right in your face and shouting at you, and I guess there's a place for that, but it's not really encouraging. And that's not who Jesus was. He's not going to be someone, you know, sometimes when I was younger, I had these thoughts where God is kind of waiting for me to sin, and he's like Zeus with his lightning bolts getting ready to just throw them at me. And that's, that's not it. He's not a, a loud, boisterous guy. Jesus was not someone who came shouting. He was meek. He was, he was calm. He was gentle. Um, and don't mistake that for weakness, though. Uh, next one. Uh, a bruised reed he will not break. A dimly lit wick he will not extinguish. This is one passage that I have to preach to myself continually. Uh, I know that when I look at what I know about Scripture, when I look at what God's revealed to me, when I look at how good He's been to me, I should be completely on fire, a blaze that anybody can look at and see, wow, I can see God, I can see Jesus in Him, I just look at everything He does, I get how good He's been to me, the things He's done, the, the, the blessings I've had in my life, what He's revealed to me, the knowledge I have, I should be this thing that is just on fire, and a lot of times I feel like a smoldering wick. A lot more often, if I'm honest, I feel like a smoldering wick that is on the edge of, God, I don't know how you can be proud of me, I don't know how you can be uh, pleased with me, I don't know why you chose me, but he's not there going, I give up. A smoldering wick he will not extinguish, a bruise free, he's not going to break and the, the analogy that I heard, and I've probably said it before here, is when you think about a child learning to walk, when you think about a child that takes its first steps, nobody, when they, the first time a child walks, there's, it's not really a step, it's kind of, they, they stand up and let go of whatever they were holding on to, and they kind of fall so that they want to catch themselves, and then they do fall down. He's walking! Holy cow, look at our kids walking! But now he's walking, so now what do you do? Get up, come to mommy, come to daddy. And so then you've got to do a step in the front ways apart, and the kid takes one more step and then falls right down again. And you're not going, oh gosh, the kid's an idiot. <laughs> he's never going to get this walking thing, I don't know what. He must have, that, those are your genes, they're not my genes, we're a bunch of walkers in my family. Right? That's not what we say. We get up, let's try it again. It might take weeks. I've seen it take months. My, little, my brother's little daughter, Hallie, she was, she was pudgy and she couldn't hardly hold herself up. It took like three months for her to start walking. And ever said, come on, let's do it again. Let's do it again. And I, I get that picture in my head of Christ when I'm feeling like a smoldering wick when I should be a furnace in place. Get up, let's try again. All right, he's not going to push me out. He's not the guy that's going to be shouting in my face and I give up on you. I can't, I can't believe you're not going to And that's how he is with all of us. And lastly, he will not be disheartened or crushed. Jesus can't lose. He didn't lose. Now I want you to think about the last time that you were completely confident going into something. You know, when you're doing something and you're not really sure if you're going to have much success, you're sitting there going, ah, I'm going to give it a shot. I'll try. We'll just see what happens. When you know for a fact, there's, listen, I have calculated every possible angle and I cannot lose. You're totally different. And when I've got complete confidence in something where I know it's a sure thing, I'm not going to lose. I've got nothing to worry about. Jesus is a sure thing. We've got nothing that we need to worry about. And again, the series is called The God of Comfort. In this passage, God is challenging the nations around to compare their gods to himself. He says, listen, compare your stuff to me. Let me see how they stand up compared to me. And when they can't stand up, he proves that he does stand up. He predicts the future. It wasn't a too comforting thing, and then he goes a little bit beyond that to predict the real comfort, the Messiah, for the nation of Israel. That was a really, really good and comforting prediction for the nation of Israel, especially on the heels. I mean, this is the passage just goes right from one to the other. A king is going to come from the north and tread you like mortar. But I'm also going to send someone who will do what you guys failed to do and bring justice, who's not going to, not going to snuff you out. He's comforting them. This should bring us the same kind of comfort today. The only difference is, is that we don't have to wait and hope that God is promising the truth. 
We actually need to look back at the history of who Jesus was and find our comfort in the promises that have been kept, not hoping that the promise that was just made will be kept. There's really not much dispute about who Jesus is, or I'm sorry, about, about who, if Jesus lived. Jesus Christ was a verified person that did walk the face of this earth. There's a lot of dispute about if he is who he claimed to be, but there's no dispute about the fact that, who, that he did live here on this earth. And we're about to take the Lord's Supper, and as we're doing that, I can't help but think that there's only, there's two categories of people that are in this room right now when we're thinking about the comfort of God and, and Jesus and, and who he is to us and where, where that lines up with the idols that we have in our lives. So you're either in the camp where you have trusted Jesus as your Savior or you haven't. And if you haven't trusted Jesus as your Savior yet, you're still looking to yourself in all the ways that you can provide your security and your freedom. And it's again, maybe it's your bank account, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's your talents, maybe it's your job, maybe it's your family. All of those things are going to come up empty. Until Jesus, the thing that's real, the God that is the only one that can actually live up to the standards that he set for himself, you can't, you're going to come up empty. You're going to feel insecure. You're going to have your freedoms taken away. And you're going to be looking at things that are going to let you down. And the good news is, is that you do not have to suspend your intellect and your reason to say, well, I'll blindly, I guess, believe. There was a guy who uh, was talking about all the different prophecies that predict the Messiah and things that would be about Jesus' life. And the way he put it, if you take just eight prophecies about the person of Jesus that we can verify that were true, the likelihood of one person fulfilling all of this is as if you were the first blanket the entire earth landmass with silver dollars 120 feet high, and then mark one of those silver dollars and randomly bury it somewhere on the earth, and then ask one person to travel the entire earth and find that one dollar the very first time. That's if we take eight prophecies about Jesus and look at him fulfilling it. What's the likelihood that one person could actually do that? Okay? Listen, I am a skeptic. I am someone who needs to have answers. I don't blindly follow anything. I will Google and YouTube and read and ask questions and do all kinds of stuff before I finally get my mind made up. And when it is made up, good luck trying to change it. So trust me here. When I say that I trusted Jesus as my Savior, it was not because someone said, hey, Jesus is the Lord of you know, the world. He died for your sins. You should believe in him. Cool. Sounds good. It took a lot to get me to that point. And if you want to get to that point, you're saying, I, I have some questions. I can't quite get there. There's a lot of people that would be happy to answer those questions, and when we take communion here, that's a great time, not to partake, because there's nothing special about bread and grape juice. That's not going to give you any superpowers. That's, that's for the believer to enjoy. All right, so if you don't, if you don't have that, that salvation yet, if you haven't trusted Jesus as your Savior, if you're still looking to yourself and stuff that's going to let you down in this world, then please abstain and talk to Pastor Al, talk to myself, talk to Pastor Jason. We would be happy to explain what it means to fully put your trust in Jesus. And the other person in this room might be somebody who is the believer, but you keep going back to the old stuff. You keep going back to finding your security in who you are and the things that you can do because life hasn't really turned out the way that you would like it to. And if you were the one in control, you would have done things differently. Maybe you didn't get that job. Maybe you did get let go. Maybe you got some really bad news from a doctor. You heard that somebody just passed away. And things have not lined up the way that you want them to. And instead of trusting in God, who knows way more than you could ever know, who says he loves you, the hairs of your head are numbered, I have plans to prosper you, not to destroy you. Right? We can look at all this process, and instead of trusting in him, we're going back to ourselves. And if that's you today, I, I challenge you as we take the Lord's Supper, uh, if Pastor Alan and Ron would come up and we can do that, as, as you get ready to take the Lord's Supper, just spend some time with you and God. And just say, Lord, I, I know you intellectually, and I trust that you are who you say you are. I believe that Jesus did come and you died for my sins, but in my circumstances right now, I'm having a real hard time letting go of the idols that I put in place and trusting that you, in fact, are the one who's going to provide me the security and the freedom that I know I'm actually searching for. Just take some time to be honest with God. He knows everything anyways. There's nothing you're going to say that's going to surprise him. 
It's not like if you don't confess this thing, he's not going to know that you're struggling with it. It's nothing wrong with struggling. We're allowed to struggle. We're going to go to that. We're human. So take this time. Don't just eat some bread and drink some grape juice and walk out of here. You serve, if you trusted Jesus, the true God, the one who created all that and who knows what's going to come and who knows you personally and has plans for your life. Trust in him. Be honest with him. Be real with him right now. And take some time and not walk out of here just going through the motions. Trust in the real one and only the true God. So Pastor Al, you can finish this up as we get ready to take the Lord's Supper.